Hello, this is Lisa, welcoming you to this week's Talking News. Please forgive any background noise because today I come live from recording the Hello Everyone QR codes at 11 police stations around Hampshire. Due to the success of our Sight for White Hello Everyone QR code outside Newport Police Station, we've now been commissioned to put them across all of the police stations across Hampshire. The codes can be scanned by any mobile phone and they tell you how to go through the door with information, for example, is the door opening inwards, outwards, sliding, is it automatic, is it push, is it pull? Then, once inside the station, it tells you how to go and find the reception desk. We're very pleased that Hampshire Police Station have taken a on this accessibility feature across the entire region. In the office this week, we've also been very pleased to be programming the Alexas and starting to deliver them out to our members. If you would like to listen to the talking news on an Alexa, or perhaps you already are, please don't hesitate to give the office a call. We can help with setup and we can help with providing a device. This week, we've also been testing the new Google skill. This isn't quite ready to launch yet, but we hope it will be done by the end of June. We have, however, noticed that some people have been sent USB sticks and not returned them to date. We are very appreciative that this could be because people are still isolating and unable to get outside. If you are in a position that you've had the USB stick and still want to continue receiving them, but haven't managed to post them back yet, please could we ask that you give the office a call on 52205 and we can make sure that we continue the supply to them and perhaps arrange a collection or an alternative way to drop them back. Finally this week we have also been putting into place the plans to hopefully reopen on the 1st of July. This of course is always subject to the announcement which we believe will be next week. Please everybody stay safe. Thank you very much, Lisa. Isle of Wight screening event highlights severity of prostate cancer from Isle of Wight Radio, read by Susan. Around 30% of men who attended a prostate cancer screening event on the Isle of Wight showed potential early signs of cancer. Organised by the Isle of Wight Prostate Cancer Support Group, the COWS event saw 250 men provide blood samples. Of those, 75 were advised to seek medical advice, while others were told to undergo repeat screening testing within the next 12 months. Blood samples were taken to the Queen Alexander Hospital in Portsmouth where they were tested for increased levels of prostate-specific antigen, PSA. PSA is protein produced by both cancerous and non-cancerous tissue in the prostate and can be an early sign of cancer. The screening allows people to be alerted to the risk at an early age so they can seek further tests from their GP as identifying prostate cancer at an early stage gives men the best chance of a full recovery. Alan Taylor, chairman of the Isle of Wight Prostate Cancer Support Group said, We would like to thank all our supporters and volunteers who made the screening event possible and to all those who chose to get tested. We had been advised by NHS Isle of Wight that they were concerned by the drop in referrals over the COVID period and so there was an expectation of higher number, numbers than our usual 10% with abnormal results. This year we are using a new more accurate and detailed protocol to issue the results to the men. This means that not only are some men being recommended to seek further medical advice from their GP, but also some have been recommended to, effect, to attend another PSA test within the next 12 months so that further results can be attained. Putting these two groups together resulted in 75 men receiving these instructive results. We wish to thank our partners in organising and running this event, including all our volunteers on the day, and especially Whitelink for supporting us with travel to help our courier to deliver the 250 blood samples from the Isle of Wight to QA Hospital in Portsmouth. Last month, Isle of Wight Radio revealed more than 300 are diagnosed with the illness each year on the island. The Isle of Wight Prostate Cancer Support Group is planning its next PSA blood test event, the second of four this year on July the 24th. Understanding what the UK government wants to do with your GP records from On the White, read by Sue. 
The government wants to transfer everyone's GP records into a single county-wide database. They say it will improve the system, but they will also sell access to it. Read both sides of the argument and how to opt out. Readers will need to act soon if they want to protect access to their healthcare data from potentially being sold onto third parties. As part of a programme to update the system that captures data from digitised GP records, information about your mental and sexual health or details of test results or medications you are prescribed could be made available to third parties. NHS Digital say the data collected from GPs is needed to support a wide variety of research and analysis to help run and improve health and care service. Others are concerned with how the data might be used or access to it sold to third parties. The government have instructed NHS Digital to gather the following personnel information. Data about diagnosis, symptoms, observations, test results, medications, allergies, immunisations, referrals, recalls and appointments, including information about physical, mental and sexual health. Data on sex, ethnicity and sexual orientation, data about staff who have treated patients, med confidential, your data will be sold, med confidential, who is this? Argue that the system is being rushed and that patients are not being informed of what is happening. They say that copies of your data will still be sold, i.e. disseminated for payment, not accessed exclusively via a safe setting, even though NHS Digital has one. NHS Digital state they will not be selling your data, but rather that they charge those who want to access its data. A price list can be found on the website. The government programme is formally called General Practice Data for Planning and Research and was announced after the Queen's speech last month. Until today, the government planned to push this through by the start of July. After accusations of rushing, this has been extended to the 1st of September 2021. The government argues that the system for gathering patient data is over 10 years old and needs replacing. The new improved system to collect data from GPs they say will reduce work for GPs so they have more time to focus on patient care, explain clearly how data is used to help patients feel confident and informed, mean data is collected, stored and accessed in a secure and consistent way. Find out more on the NHS Digital website. Your data will be shared, med confidential, explain. The plans are to merge each person's medical and social care records into one single overarching record. Information about each patient is going to be extracted from GP surgery systems and used in running the administration of the NHS. It would also be given to researchers. Data about patients is a valuable commodity that can stimulate the pharmaceutical market and encourage developments in medicine and IT. NHS Digital say they do not collect patients' names or exactly where they live. Postcodes are collected. They add that the data that could directly identify someone is pseudonymized before it leaves their GP practice. They would only re-identify the data if there was a lawful reason to do so and it would need to be compliant with data protection law. Others are not so confident that all the data will remain anonymized. How to opt out. The government have today, the 8th of June, announced an extension for patients to opt out of having their GP data extracted into the new system. If you don't want your private healthcare data to be shared outside your GP surgery, you can opt out, but you should do it as soon as possible, at least a week before the 1st of September 2021. Full details of why you might want to opt out and how to can be found on the Med Confidential website. Who are Med Confidential? Med Confidential is an independent, non-partisan organisation working with patients and medics, service users and care professionals, drawing advice from a network of experts in the fields of health, informatics, computer security, law, ethics and privacy. This is Chris reading an article from the Island Echo. Work to restore historic harbour walls to begin this month. 
Work to maintain Newport's historic harbour walls is set to start later this month. The near 400,000 regeneration is intended to restore the walls to their original condition, using specialist techniques to retain their historic appearance. Councillor Phil Jordan, Cabinet Member for Transport and Infrastructure, said the repairs were essential to preserve the very fabric of the harbour. He said, The majority of the remedial works comprise repointing and the replacement of missing bricks and stones. Where possible, it is planned to reuse the original bricks and stones where they can be recovered from the river and are suitable for reuse. Where original materials are not suitable for reuse, then matching reclaimed materials will be sourced. The work has been planned and paid for by the Isle of Wight Council, but it will be carried out by local contractor MCM Construction Limited based in Newport. A survey was commissioned in March 2014 to ascertain the condition of the walls, sections of which are listed, and the level of works required to ensure they are safe and fit for purpose. The report identified significant amounts of works that were required. The first phase of repairs will focus on the most vulnerable sections. The works are due to start on the 21st of June and be completed by the end of September. The project follows a major project to dredge Newport Harbour, removing thousands of tonnes of silt from the bed of the River Medina to safeguard its continued use as a recreational and commercial waterway. This is Alison reading an article from Isle of Wight Radio. Isle of Wight goalkeeper secures championship deal with Blackpool. Isle of Wight goalkeeper Stuart Moore has signed a contract extension with Blackpool FC. The Isle of Wight-born footballer has agreed a new 12-month contract keeping him at Bloomfield Road until at least 2022, with an option to extend by a further year. Moore, 26, was an unused substitute in the League One playoff final, as Blackpool beat Lincoln City 2-1 to secure promotion to the Championship. On extending his contract, Moore, a former Sandown High School student, said, I'm really pleased to get this deal over the line and to be staying at Blackpool for another season. For the team to have gained promotion at Wembley last month was a fantastic achievement. From the first day I joined the club, the lads have been excellent and it's a fantastic group to be a part of. I'm looking forward to the season ahead and can't wait to get started. This is Brian reading an article from On The White. Your town could be up for civic status as part of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. As part of the celebrations to mark the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, councils across the nation are invited to showcase their civic pride and put their towns on the map. Her Majesty the Queen has agreed for a competition to be held to grant the prestigious and rare civic honours of city status and Lord Mayor or Lord Provost status to a select number of worthy towns and cities in the United Kingdom. This will be the first time in 10 years that Her Majesty awards civic honours and the occasion comes as part of celebrations to mark the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. As part of this government's commitment to levelling up and increasing opportunity across the United Kingdom, Local authorities in England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland can enter the competition and make a case for why its area deserves to be granted one of these honours. For the first time, the City Status Competition will also be open to applications from the Crown Dependencies and Overseas Territories. Minister of State for the Constitution and Devolution, Chloe Smith, said The Civic Honours Competition is an opportunity to promote your hometown and win an honour for it that will last for all time. I encourage entries from local authorities in every part of the UK. 
from vibrant towns and cities with di distinct identities, history and sense of community. The brilliance of the United Kingdom is rooted in diverse and unique communities brought together by a shared sense of civic pride. So I have no doubt the competition will be fierce, but success will be a historic moment of celebration for the winners, which will take its place within Her Majesty's Platinum Jubilee. 2022 will be a year of celebration with three showstopper events held across the UK. Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games, the Queen's Platinum Jubilee and Festival UK 2022 will bring people together and inspire the next generation as we renew Build Back Better from the coronavirus pandemic. Culture Secretary Oliver Dowden said, as we look forward to a year of celebration, growth and renewal in 2022, this prestigious competition will inspire civic pride in communities right across the UK. It's a great opportunity for towns and cities in every corner of the country to showcase their heritage and tell us more about the people and places that make their local area so unique and a fitting tribute to Her Majesty's reign in her Platinum Jubilee year. The Civic Honours Competition will provide local authorities with the chance to showcase their civic pride, interesting heritage and record of innovation, putting their hometowns on the map and bringing greater prosperity of opportunity. The competition will close on the 8th of December 2021 with full entry guidelines and an application form have been published on the website. Considered on its merits, all valid entries will receive individual consideration on their merits before recommendations will be made by Ministers to Her Majesty the Queen. The number of awards made across the UK, overseas territories and Crown dependencies will depend on the strength of the applications received. Her Majesty the Queen will be the first British monarch to have reached 70 years on the throne. This is a truly historic moment for the country and it is right that we celebrate it in a way that recognises the strength of community across the United Kingdom, Crown dependencies and overseas territories. Although there are no specific criteria for city status or Lord Mayor or Provost status, the government is interested in hearing about what makes your town special. We want to know about its civic pride, cultural infrastructure, interesting heritage, history and traditions, vibrant and welcoming community, record of innovation, sound governance and administration, associations with royalty and other particularly distinctive features, age, residents or communities, who have, been, who have made widely recognised significant contributions to society and cultural infrastructure. Isle of Wight swimmers invited to Mini Key Arts Festival from the Isle of Wight Radio, read by Susan. A group of open water swimmers on the Isle of Wight are inviting islanders to come along to their mini festival later this month at the Key Arts Newport. Swim the White launched around six months ago after initially starting as an outdoor swimming group. Now it is inviting islanders the chance to get together with others for an evening of art, science and advice on safe sea swimming. It doesn't matter if you have never braved the cold water before or if you are a fanatic open water swimming. Either way, you are invited to come along to vitamin C at the quay. Islanders will also have the chance to talk to two time 10 kilometre open water world champion and Olympic silver medalist Kerry Ann Payne. Endurance swimmer Lewis Pugh will also be there, as well as the Outdoor Swimmer magazine, for an evening of films, socialising, and talks. Sandy 
one of the Swim the Whites directors, told Isle of Wight Radio, The event is a mixture of talks, stalls, food and films. You need to book in advance. We have some amazing talks. We are also going to have local artists, small businesses with their stalls. We are also lucky to have sponsorship from Mermaid Gin. So Gin will be there in our Mermaid Lounge. If you are involved in any activity that you think may be of interest to open water swimmers, contact me as there is still time to get involved in the event. If anyone wants to improve their swimming or get into cold water, get in touch with us. Vitamin C at the key is about sharing our love of open water swimming and it is an opportunity to get together with other swimmers and share other information that is out there. There will be talks from Dr Heather Massey from Portsmouth University, Extreme Conditions Lab on Cold Water Swimming, a representative from RNLI on Tides and Currents, Dr Roger Herbert, Marine Biologist on Marine Flora and Fauna, a representative from Southern Water on water quality with the opportunity to pose questions and concerns. Jenny Ball, a local veteran swimming celebrity. Nigel George, talking about articology. There will also be local artists and small businesses selling and promoting things that are of interest to swimmers and sea lovers. Islanders can also get involved in a raffle with prizes from sponsors that include a bottle of mermaid gin and a subscription to Outdoor Swimming magazine. The event is on Saturday, June the 26th at 5pm. Positive action results in clean start for formal bus station from On the Right, read by Sue. A group of shopkeepers fed up with visitors to their town seeing the piles of rubbish dumped at the formal bus station put their hands in their pockets and had it cleared away. The positive action of several independent shopkeepers on Ventnor's Pier Street has resulted in the removal of fly-tipped rubbish. As reported earlier in the week, several businesses clubbed together to pay for the fly-tipped rubbish to be removed. An ongoing problem. Fly-tipping has been a problem at the site of the derelict former bus station for many years, but has intensified in recent months. Each time something was dumped there, it encouraged more rubbish to be left. Now the rubbish has gone and all the mess underneath has been swept up and it's less of an eyesore. You're on camera. For those thinking about dumping more rubbish, beware of the new CCTV cameras in operation. Shopkeepers also ask those in the town to keep an eye out for fly tippers attempting to dump their rubbish at the site in the future. Well done to those of you who put up their hands in their pockets to have this mess tidied up. This is Alison reading an article from Isle of Wight Radio. Car crashes into barbers in Ventnor. A car has crashed into a barber's in Ventnor on Wednesday afternoon. Emergency services have been called to Ventnor High Street. Isle of Wight Radio listeners say a car has gone into Fez Turkish Barbers near to Tesco Express. Police and the Isle of Wight Ambulance Service have been called to the incident. Glass could be seen on the floor and a road sign has been damaged. No one was injured, according to police. A spokesperson for Hampshire Constabulary said, We were called at 3.46pm on Wednesday the 9th of June to reports of a single vehicle collision on High Street, Ventnor. A car was in collision with street furniture and a storefront, causing damage. No injuries were reported. This is Chris, reading an article from On the White. Record Store Day returns to Ventnor Exchange with two dates in 2021. Record Store Day will be split over two Saturdays this year and includes a superb list of albums. Record Store Day returns to Ventnor Exchange this weekend, having been postponed last year due to the Covid pandemic. The team at Ventnor Exchange have been gearing up for one of their busiest days of the year. 
taking place this year over two Saturdays, the 12th of June and the 17th of July, deliveries of albums have started to arrive at the exchange and there are some corkers on the list. The titles on offer include albums by the likes of Incredible Bongo Band, Pear Ubu, The Door, Notorious B.I.G., Lee Scratch Perry, Mogwai and Fila Kuti. As the week goes on, Ventnor Exchange will be updating the list, so make sure you keep checking back. Ventnor Exchange will be open from the earlier time of 9am on the big day. There won't be live bands this year due to the Covid guidelines, but there will be DJs playing throughout the day and the bar will be open as normal. This is Alison reading an article from Isle of Wight Radio. Man arrested after making threats to kill in ride. A man has been arrested on suspicion of possessing an offensive weapon and making threats to kill in ride. Police were called to Sandcroft Avenue shortly before 8pm on Tuesday night following reports of a disturbance in the street, where it's alleged a man was making threats. Officers attended, and a 29-year-old man from Ride was arrested on suspicion of possession of an offensive weapon in a public place, threats to kill, and assault of an emergency worker. He remains in custody at this time. This is Brian reading an article from the Island Echo. A woman with 18 previous convictions, mostly for theft offences, has appeared before the Isle of Wight Magistrates Court once again, charged with two counts of theft from a shop. Emma James, 36, currently of Newport Road in Ventnor, was put before magistrates on Tuesday, accused of stealing £50.70 pence worth of shopping from Morrison's in Newport, across two occasions. Liz Miller for the Crown Prosecution Service told the court that on the 24th of April, James entered the Morrison supermarket and picked up three candles and a blanket. She proceeded to the self-scan area where she scanned just one of the candles before walking out with all of the products. Police caught up with Emma James and her boyfriend outside the store where the products were recovered from inside a suitcase. The second incident is said to have occurred on the 27th of April, just three days later. This time, Jane stole three gin fizzes and a chicken sandwich. She walked straight out of the shop without making any attempt to pay. The items were not recovered. Defending, Jane's solicitor said that alcoholism homelessness and drug abuse all played a part in her life and that she was vulnerable, especially after an unsuitable previous relationship. After pleading guilty to theft from a shop, Emma James was given a six-month community order by magistrates with a requirement of 10 rehabilitation days. She was ordered to pay £45 costs with a £95 surcharge as well as compensation to the value of £16.70. White gift cards offer a new way to shop. From the Isle of Wight Radio, read by Susan. Shoppers with white gift cards are enjoying some of the island's best brands as local shops and businesses reopen. And now there's a chance to win a free white gift card worth £100. Shoppers across the island and beyond are using the white gift card to buy from over 90 Isle of Wight businesses, both in-store and online. After a successful start selling the cards, the scheme is now starting to pay back as shoppers with a gift card start using them, getting themselves some great local bargains as well as supporting businesses as they recover from the challenges of lockdown. Island shoppers can win a card by sharing on social media where they have spent their local gift card 
liking or following town and city gift cards on Twitter or Facebook and tagging the company on their photo to be put into a prize draw to win £100 white gift card or other card of their choice. The Isle of Wight Council's Cabinet Member for Regeneration, Councillor Julie Jones-Evans explained, I was delighted to launch the white card gift card in cows last year supported by White Fibre. Over 70 white gift cards were purchased in 2020 alone and it is a good to see how well it is going. The gift card scheme follows on from recent shop local initiatives on the island such as Fiverr Fest and Let's Buy Local. Now is the time to get out and grab some superb high street deals as our white gift card members are offering great products and services to tempt shoppers back into their shops and online too, of course. If you've got a white gift card, spend it and enter the competition. You could win £100. And if you're looking for a present to give a loved one, the card is going to be a winner for everyone. Seeing the island shops and businesses coming back to life at last is a delight. And I'm sure that the white gift card will continue to play its part in this recovery. Caroline Hurley, the proprietor of Be Calm Spa Cows, signed up to accept the white gift card at her business. She said, We are a sports massage and beauty therapy centre. We joined the white gift card when it was first launched back in November. We've had quite a few sales since we reopened through the gift card with both new and existing customers taking advantage of it. Clients enjoy the convenience of the white gift card and it's good to know that the money is going to support local jobs and companies. Colin Munro is the Managing Director of Myconex, the company managing the town and city gift card scheme. He commented, customers have taken the first steps and purchased a white gift card. Now is the time to spend it. A town and city gift card, like the white gift card, is a piece of potential. The potential to support a small independent business which may have struggled through the last year. The potential to keep money locked into where you live and the potential to safeguard jobs, livelihoods and the vibrancy of where you live. Your white gift card can stay in your bag, wallet or in a drawer at home or it can be turned into drinks with friends at your local fish and chips on the seafront, a new outfit for the warmer weather to come or a long-awaited haircut. Now is the time to get out and spend locally. Isle of Wight Special Needs Play Park approved by planning officers from On the White, read by Sue. There have been some concerns about rights of way access, but planning officers are satisfied and have approved the wheelchair accessible play park. The Isle of Wight's first wheelchair friendly playground has been given the green light. Proposed by Godsill Parish Council, the play park on Central Mead off Godsill High Street will be built to include inclusive equipment. Approved by the Isle of Wight Council's planning authority last week, a wheelchair swing, an open lowered roundabout and ramped play equipment, all suitable for wheelchair users, will be installed. Other play apparatus such as slides, climbing nets and a zip wire are all marked on the plans, as well as some adult exercise equipment. Commenting on the proposals back in March, the former Cabinet Member for Children's Services, Education and Skills, Councillor Paul Brading, said he was acutely aware of the lack of quality outdoor play parks on the island. But the carefully thought out design and selection of the equipment would cater for the children it's intended for. Nikki Collinson Phoenix, part of the Godshill Play Park project, said the proposed play would not only be a huge asset to Godshill, 
but also to the island and allows families and children to be able to play together, regardless of any challenges they may face. The proposals would also see the current tired pavilion building demolished and a new community centre with a hall, kitchen area and changing rooms built instead. Nikki said the two proposals on Centra Mead were perfectly located and meant Godsill could have a central community hub it could be proud of. Concerns have been raised, however, over the new play area, which would affect the public right-of-way, which would cross the field. Island Roads recommended the development be refused because of inadequate access width, pedestrian access, parking provision, and the generation of traffic onto the public highway through a substandard access. Council planning officers said they were of the view that the work would not change the use of the land, nor intensify the users of the site that could be expected. The scheme would be delivered in two phases, starting with a play area followed by the community centre. Recommending granting permission, officers said, the proposed development would provide for an improved community asset, which would upgrade and promote the existing outdoor space. The proposed works would protect residential and visual amenity and would provide betterment to the current facilities. 18 conditions were attached to the permission, which includes a stipulation that the development should begin within three years. This is Alison, reading an article from Isle of Wight Radio. Burst pipe closes popular East Cow's paddling pool. East Cow's popular paddling pool has had to close because of a burst pipe and children turning blue. East Cow's town council has apologised and wants to reassure islanders that the blue paint is in no way harmful and can be removed using soap and water and an exfoliating glove. As previously reported on Friday, the pool had only just been reopened by the town council, but has been shut immediately. The council has received reports that youngsters were seen riding bicycles in the pool on Friday evening and CCTV is being checked, as it says it could have damaged the surface and allowed water to seep under the paint surface. The cause of the paint lifting is being investigated, and also the pipework, so the pool will need to be drained. It is not known when it will reopen. A spokesperson for the town council said, We realise how disappointing this will be to everyone, but we take our responsibilities to the community seriously and will always act in their best interests. We are hopeful that the pool will be open once again in time for the summer holidays. This is Chris, reading an article from On The White. Free clean for Splash Park, thanks to Isle of Wight business, New Gents. Well done to Isle of Wight cleaning business, New Gents, who cleaned the ride Splash Park free of charge ready for the summer season. The popular free-to-use splash park on Ride's Esplanade had fallen on hard times. Closed last year due to the Covid pandemic and with obsolete pumps and pipework, it was in a rather sorry state until local businessman Dominic Gentleman, director of island-based cleaning business New Gents Limited, organised a free clean for this ageing facility. In a great gesture from other local businesses, Harvey's Waste Clearance removed 30 sacks of rubbish collected by the Nugent's team at no charge and the Alamo restaurant on Ride's Esplanade delivered a free lunch to the hungry workers. A real community effort, well timed for Volunteers Week. The trustees who have operated the Splash Park each summer since 2014 as part of the Waterside Community Trust are hugely grateful to all the businesses involved in the clean-up. Get the water flowing. Now all that remains is for the Trust, the charity which also operates Ride Seafront Swimming Pool, to try to get the creaking and ageing pumps and pipes to work for another season after the prolonged Covid shutdown. It is hoped that a survey will be undertaken soon. This is Brian reading an article from On the White. 
Housing, health and planning must invest in nature to improve people's lives, say the wildlife trusts. New report calls on all parts of government and local authorities to unlock the benefits of nature to society. A new report from the Wildlife Trust reveals how restoring nature at a time when it has never been more degraded can bring wide-ranging benefits to society, help reach net negative carbon emissions and rebuild the economy following the pandemic. The report argues that taking a transformational approach to putting nature at the heart of a sustainable green economy will create more jobs, ensuring that land and sea are properly managed for the long term, enable people to live happier, healthier lives and restore our much depleted natural world. A wilder recovery says that there's been a failure to recognise the vital role that nature plays in our society and economy and that this must be urgently addressed with a £1 billion per year funding package to restore nature at scale. Government spending on biodiversity has shrunk by 33% over five years even though big promises have been made to restore 30% of land for nature by 2030. DEFRA's funding is inadequate to tackle the size of the task ahead and other government departments are doing little to help reach this target either. Worse still, some government proposals such as planning reforms threaten to damage our natural world even further. The Wildlife Trusts believe that all areas of government, locally and nationally, can benefit from working with nature as well as helping it to recover. For example, Treasury. Research shows investing in nature will bring good jobs to the places that need them most. An investment plan in our environment can provide the new jobs and skills needed to tackle the nature and climate crisis. Surrey's Wildlife Trust's naturally richer Holmesdale project, for example, has shown how repairing nature can help drive our economic recovery. Housing. New development should integrate nature into designs for new housing, whilst also making communities more attractive and healthier places to live. In Gloucestershire, the local Wildlife Trust has worked in partnership to set new standards to define what good green infrastructure looks like. So far, over 30,000 homes have been accredited using these Building with Nature standards. These standards need to be adopted at scale. Health. A vast body of evidence links nature with better health. Equal access to wild places is vital because such places provide a natural health service. Investing in nature-based activities improves people's skills and confidence, helping them get into employment and stay active. Lancashire's Wildlife Trust's My Place scheme, for example, empowers people, improves their well-being and saves the NHS money. Planning. We need to think big if we are to ensure that 30% of land and seas is protected to help the natural world thrive again by 2030. But planning reforms look set to harm nature further and the cumulative impact of developments is not being taken into account. Nature should be integrated into new developments and a new designation is needed for land that is put aside for nature's recovery. Wild Belt. Safeguarding the sea. If offshore renewable energy is developed without strenuous efforts to minimise negative impacts on marine ecosystems, it will damage the ability of underwater habitats to help tackle climate change. We should designate 30% of the protected sites network as highly protected marine areas as a matter of urgency. 
The sea must be protected for wildlife and for the carbon its habitats can store. Craig Bennett, chief executive of the Wildlife Trust, says, Ultimately, our economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of nature and not the other way around. Everything we hold dear, our health, homes and livelihoods, depends on what nature provides. It's time we recognise this and behave accordingly. Nature is our strongest ally in building a resilient recovery after COVID-19, but for too long decisions have come at the expense of the natural world and the amount we spend on activities which damage nature still far outstrips our spending to restore it. We must halt old-fashioned business as usual and stop wasting public money on the polluting infrastructure of the past, such as £27 billion on new roads, and invest instead in green infrastructure. This means restoring wild places for wildlife, flood prevention, storing carbon, and to improve our physical and mental well-being. Rather than propose measures to weaken our planning system, we need it strengthened so that it stops badly planned developments and rewards good development that protects and enhances nature and improves people's lives. The next 10 years must be a time of renewal, of rewilding our lives, of green recovery, not just more of the same old thinking that perpetuates our current mess. This is Alison reading an article from the Island Echo. Islanders can now dump rubbish every other day as tip restrictions eased. Islanders can now visit tips at Lynn Bottom and Afton Marsh every other day instead of once a week, the Isle of Wight Council has confirmed. Since the start of the pandemic, restrictions have been in place to limit the number of visits to the island's household waste and recycling centres. Originally, Islanders could only dump their rubbish once every two weeks, which was then eased to allow visits once a week. This was to aid social distancing by stopping an influx of people arriving all at the same time. Now, as life returns to normal in the latter stages of the pandemic, Amy and the Isle of Wight Council have decided to ease the restrictions further by allowing the dumping of rubbish once every two days. However, the requirement for all visitors to pre-book a 15-minute slot 24 hours ahead of visiting still exists, meaning there is still a level of inconvenience for islanders. Those looking to visit Lynn Bottom or Afton Marsh can book an appointment up to two weeks in advance at www.iow.gov.uk forward slash HWRC booking or call the council's waste services team on 01983 823777 as well as the inconvenience of booking 24 hours in advance and sticking to a 15 minute time slot Lynn Bottom is still only open between 10 hundred hours and 18 hundred hours daily with Afton Marsh open three days a week Monday, Saturday and Sunday, between 10 hundred hours and 18 hundred hours. This is the second part of the talking news read by Pauline and... Madeline. And we begin with letters to the editor. First letter, from Richard Ferraro of Ventnor. I sympathise with David Jones, letters extra 28th 521. Yes, road traffic is increasing and transport infrastructure is important. However... The Isle of Wight is unusual. With the exception of Newport, the island escaped the onslaught of bypasses and dual carriageways in the 1960s and 70s. A lucky escape because fewer roads have helped preserve the island's beauty and character. Now the way forward is not to invest in projects that increase road traffic, for example a twin bore road tunnel from Gosport, nor should the island's road system be expanded, though some bottlenecks could be relieved. The solution for the Isle of Wight is low or zero carbon public transport that improves connections to, from and within the island, and which at the same time promotes economic development, regeneration and productive use of brownfield sites. 
To achieve this, the island needs an expanded network of railways with reduced dependencies on cars. With this in mind, I look forward to the results of the current DFT-funded feasibility study, looking at the business case for more railway infrastructure on the island. And from Stephen Inman from Newport, here's hoping new council gives support. It's been my life's calling. Many people have spent a lifetime bringing service to a particular job. However, that doesn't necessarily mean they have been excellent in their role, of course. Dr Carol Tozer has endured a difficult time heading the Isle of Wight Council's Adult and Social Care Department, and her staff know only too well the struggle they have had to endure creatively to remain effective amidst the cuts she made to services. One wishes Dr Tozer the very best in her retirement. Hopefully, with a new administration heading our Isle of Wight Council, the island can look forward to genuinely building back better and provide the support our island community deserves. From George Yates of Binstead, taxing second homes will alleviate this issue. The crisis in the rental housing market is in large part due to very low interest rates for savers. ISAs return nothing these days and savers have turned to buying second, third homes, properties which they then put on the rental market as an investment. Now there is a bonanza in demand for housing, particularly in desirable locations like the Isle of Wight, investor landlords are cashing in and selling up while prices are high to make a quick and very lucrative killing. The only way to stop this and return affordable houses to families desperate to buy affordable homes is to heavily tax second home owners, making buying housing purely for investment financially a very unattractive proposition. But there is one major fly in the ointment. The party of greed are never, never going to do that, are they? And the British public would never vote for a political party that contemplated such an idea. And from Christopher Dodd, Newport, silence may have been golden. As reported in the county press on the 4th of June, the newly elected chairman of the Isle of Wight Council has without doubt got his chairmanship off in an uncompromisingly startling way. Many Isle of Wight electors will undoubtedly describe his decision to abolish pre-council meeting prayers as an expression of free will or, more seriously, a self-indulgent misuse of power. Although I personally oppose the blinkered use of any sort of prayers in some sort of support of a civil function, I consider Councillor Brodie's unilateral decision should have been more considered and much less dictatorial. How very much more magnanimous would it have been for him to simply change the present convention and ask councillors to stand for a short span of silent thought and humanitarian contemplation prior to the often hurly-burly nature of council meetings. I'm sure a vast majority of Islander folk would react in positive support for an action of that mature nature. We could all believe that the simple silent moment of focusing councillors' minds would surely help in the making of the very best and most responsible decisions by our council for the good of the island. A letter, letter from Colin Green of Cowes. North-South split would have made more sense. The Boundary Commission for England has released the latest proposal for the Isle of Wight's two constituencies. This is further modified from the previous proposal, offering an east-west split along the Medina to Newport that finishes at Luckham Down. Whilst this is good news and we will have a second MP, the boundary seems to be split along tighter demographic lines that might, that might produce a predictable outcome. You might argue this is good news. But if that outcome is always the same and we have a Conservative and Labour, Green, Alliance, etc, MP, then our votes will effectively be neutralised in Parliament. I wonder if it would be better to have the line drawn north to south-east from, say, Yarmouth, Newtown, through Newport, split, to finish at Luckham Down. This provides an open mix of demographic views that should lead to greater competition and chance of change rather than follow fixed political lines with no advantage to the Isle of Wight. 
And from Donna Jones, Hampshire and Isle of Wight Police and Crime Commissioner. I want all islanders to feel safe. I would like to thank the residents of the Isle of Wight for their support in the recent elections. When I visited the island on April the 28th as part of my campaign, I heard directly about some of the local concerns. I went to see the skate park, which provides the types of facilities we need for young people on the island, the family bakery Grace's, which has experienced low-level crime, and I met a cafe owner in Ryde who made me aware of crime along the seafront. I intend to get a briefing on this matter from the district commander. As your elected police and crime commissioner, I'm looking forward to the first of many visits to the island, that's today. During this visit, I intend to go out on patrol with officers and meet with local representatives and support services to gain further understanding of what is important. While a key part of being police crime commissioner is to support and challenge the chief constable in her role to deliver operational policing on the Isle of Wight and across Hampshire. It is also to ensure victims receive the support they need and to give a voice to the public. People have told me they don't feel as safe as they used to and they would like to see more police officers and I am committed to increasing police visibility. I recognise the Isle of Wight faces unique challenges and I am keen to hear more re from residents about these and to tackle the issues that are important to you. I am also pleased that in my first week in office I was able to announce additional funding to provide enhanced support for victims of domestic abuse and sexual crime on the Isle of Wight. The £127,245 funding will provide specially trained staff to support the most vulnerable victims, including support for children and young people. I not only want the Isle of Wight and Hampshire to be among the safest places to live, I want to, people to feel that they are. Stemming holiday home glut will help rental crisis. This is a letter from Stephen Crockett of Ventnor. I was glad to see last week's front page that brought attention to the crisis that is besetting so many of our fellow islanders. The people who are suffering are the very same essential workers that we've been championing, championing for the last year. They are health and shop workers, drivers, teachers, parents and children who now, after the terrible strain of Covid, are facing the unacceptable indignity of perilous housing. Looking at the inevitable tra trajectory that we are on means a migration of people to the mainland to simply have a roof over their heads with too many of those roofs in our communities becoming managed holiday lets in someone's property portfolio. Yes, the island needs holiday accommodation, but not as much as it needs securely homed residents to remain a viable community. The damage needs to be undone by reversing the tide of holiday lets that from a cursory look on the internet outnumber long-term lets by a staggering 100 to 1. Tinkering with the Council's local planning strategies will not help in time. We need bold action at government level, as taken by many European cities, to restore the balance that has been lost to protect our neighbours and future generations. Some thoughts during this Refugee Week from Glenn Kapani in Ride. This week is Refugee Week and as members of the Isle of Wight Amnesty Group, this is an important week for us to think about all the millions of people who have had to leave their homes and countries because of war, famine and persecution, and to try and make a new life elsewhere. Last October, I spent two weeks working for the charity Care for Calais. The charity has two large warehouses in Calais where food, tents, clothing etc are stored before distri distribution to the unofficial refugee camps in northern France and beyond. Each day we took hot drinks, food packages, hair cutting equipment, phone charging boards, clothing or whatever was needed. In the first week the atmosphere at the camps was normally upbeat despite the difficult circumstances. The overwhelming sense was of people waiting and hoping for a new life to begin. 
I talked to refugees about their reasons for leaving their homes, the journeys they had made and what they hoped for. Some people had been travelling from country to country for many years, hoping to be granted settled status. Many were young men travelling alone, and some were families with very young children. In the second week, the French police began mass evictions, confiscating belongings and putting people on coaches to be dropped off at the Spanish border or other random sites, often miles from any town. The evictions were often heavy-handed and threatening, done in the middle of the night and contravening the Charter of Human Rights. I was shocked to learn that the UK government was funding these evictions through UK taxpayers' money to the tune of £30 million. From Calais Beach, the view to England looks extremely daunting, and I could only wonder at how desperate people would have to be making the crossing in inflatable boats. When I returned, I was horrified to learn that the body of a man trying to make the crossing had been washed up near to where I was staying, and that a family with two young children that I had seen at one of the camps had all been drowned. Life around me in Calais and back in England all went on as normal, but what I saw will never leave me. Just after one of the evictions, we were handing out hot drinks, and in the midst of all this, a small child was so happy to be given a biscuit. Even though they had nothing and were living unwanted in a strange country, the child was still smiling. Dog fouling is spoiling forests from Tricia Merrifield of Hillisgate. We live in a very beautiful location immediately immediately alongside Parker's Forest at the northeast corner. Our corner and Mark's corner have for many years been popular locations for dog walkers and of course there has always been a minority who arrive completely unprepared and with no intention of clearing up. Throughout lockdown there was a very visible increase in the number of owners parking in the road so they could enjoy a walk. This is actually very good to see as many were bringing along their children and introducing them to the delights of walking in green space. But unfortunately with this surge in the number of dog walkers enjoying the forest has come a proliferation of excrement left in the middle of the paths and immediately alongside in what should be a wildflower verge. Also a trail of human detritus is left scattered where cars park and along the routes to and from the forest. The situation really got to me last weekend because I'm recovering from hip surgery and our bird watching friend is also needing to use a walking stick. We drove over to Tucker's Gate on the Forest Road for our annual night jar walk. Amazingly, just a very short walk from that busy road, these elusive birds can be heard churring and be seen taking flight and clapping their wings, a wonderful annual treat. Thankfully we'd taken head torches and as soon as we walked past the gate could see that the path ahead was a minefield of heap upon heap of dog excrement. We did manage to negotiate these obstacles but it really poses the question and perhaps someone reading this will have the answer as to why so many dog owners regard our beautiful island countryside as one big dog toilet. It's even worse if it's on the farmland where grazing animals have an unwelcome garnish on their meals and on one farm I'm familiar with, a field of grass was so badly dog fouled that it could not be harvested as winter forage. Forestry England have recently put signs at Hillis Gate and Mark's Corner requesting that dog walkers clear up after their dogs, so I will now ask them to put one at Tucker's Gate, but will that polite request be heeded? It's such an antisocial behaviour as so many people walking dogs also enjoy walking in Parker's Forest, and are having continually to watch where they and especially their children are walking. Pushchair wheels and bicycle tyres can so easily become dog felled, requiring a clean up job before reloading the car. So a message to all dog owners and if it's your dog it's your poo so please bag it, take it home and bin it. And now for some white memories. Remembering Puckpool Holiday Village the Puckpool Holiday Village was built on land surrounding the manor house and opened in 1938. It remained a holiday destination for thousands of visitors until it closed in 2006, then as Harcourt Sands, 
as it had combined with the next door complex of St Clair. The only break came in the war years when it became HMS Medina and the temporary home for troops waiting to be posted. Some of the site improvements and facilities were to the eventual benefit of Warner holidays. Putpool was once a very proud individual centre and during the reign of General Manager Michael Stickland it became Warner's most innovative centre in the country. Some of his ideas set new trends in the holiday industry market that were copied all over Britain. Many local functions were also held at the ride venue. Michael came to Puckpool in May 1960 for a job as a plate boy and walked there from Ride Pier a day early for a Monday start. The centre's manager, Snowy Smith, had noticed the beatnik appearance on the Sunday and told him that he wouldn't even get a job if he didn't clean himself up and get a haircut. He took the advice and became the plate boy. What a success story! Many years later he was on the main board of the rank organisation who eventually took over Warners. In those days Putpool was open only was only open from May to September and many of their staff came down to work for a summer break from London jobs. Michael Stickland, a quantity surveyor, was certainly one of those. Eager for success, he graduated to bar work and then became the overall manager of their two bars and catering facilities. When Snowy Smith died in 1972, there were rumours that a mainland manager was coming to take over. Thanks to a persuasive staff, he was virtually press-ganged into applying for the job and got it after a five-hour interview. It was an astute decision by the Warner family. Michael introduced the idea of selling wine to the diners and so much was sold the idea was taken up by the other centres. In 1978 they even gambled by opening at Christmas and had to import central heating facilities. The day before they opened both he and his assistant manager were still bleeding radiators. The following Easter they hosted the Island Soccer Festival. That Christmas opening led directly to the launch of Tinsel and Turkey weekends. They began at Putpool and in no time were copied by so many other centres and hotels throughout the country. Michael then wondered why they even had to close and subsequently hit upon the idea of weekend out-of-season cabaret breaks. Comedian Charlie Williams completely sold out the first one. It was a bargain to see one of Britain's top comedians for just 16 shillings, 80p, for the weekend. They advertised just once in the Southampton and Portsmouth evening papers and were swamped with bookings. In fact, they had a job to cope and actually overbooked. They managed to put some guests in two ride hotels. It went so well, no one worried. In Charlie's wake came Tony Christie, Joe Longthorne and huge American acts like Ben E. King, who was top of the American pop charts at the time with the re-release of Stand By Me, the Crickets, who included two of the late Buddy Holly's originals, Jerry Allison and Joe B. Maudlin, the world famous Ink Spots the stylists, who then still included their original singer Russell Tompkins and soul superstar Jimmy Ruffin. I was honoured to interview all of them and some of the special guests who came to publicise the burgeoning, burgeoning centre. These included Letitia Dean, Sharon, Sharon from EastEnders and boxing legend Henry Cooper. Another regular guest was movie icon Oliver Reed. One of his best pals was Gus Gastor, then the entertainment manager at Puckpool. Holidaymakers were surprised to see him on site, probably in the bar. He stayed in the staff chalets. I never approached him for an interview. I knew what he did to journalists. When Ollie was filming Tommy in Portsmouth, he brought the Who's Wild Man Keith Moon over with him for the night. They actually watched the South Parade Pier fire where, the, where they were filming parts of the movie from Puckpool that very night. I once interviewed Marty Wilde at Puckpool and he revealed he had come second as Reginald Smith in a talent contest at the, a, at the centre when he was just 14. He'd come by bus with his mother. On that second visit he was driving a Mercedes and called his mother from his in-car phone that first I had ever seen. 
Michael was lucky to employ so many talented greencoats. This meant their production shows were of a such a high standard. Many young performers came as regular visiting cabaret acts. Several went on to become stars. Among them were Bradley Walsh, Joe Pascal, Darren Day and Jimmy Cricket. They also had some very talented entertainment managers, including Chris Cole, Tim Savage, Derry James and Tina Monroe. Michael's brainchild for Star Cabaret Weekends was soon taken up by all the other Warner centres. Later, he was also responsible for the launch of some adult-only Warner centres and hotels. The centre also played host to some world stars from both darts and snooker. Many true legends came to display their talents. Eventually, Michael was made a regional manager for eight villages and then the operations director for all 15 Warner UK sites. Not bad for a long-haired beatnik. <laughs> Following his rise to head office stardom, the good work at the centre was carried on by several other very accomplished managers. There are a few reminders left of the golden days of Puckpool Holiday Village. Amidst the rubble, the open air swimming pool and the pineapple slide have remained invincible, but don't hold your breath. They might have gone by the time you read this. And now for some public information. And this is from Superintendent Sarah Jackson. Website has ideas to keep your children safe. We are at last beginning to see the summer sunshine and naturally this will draw people to enjoy the great outdoor spaces we have here on the island. I want to take the opportunity to encourage parents to make use of some of the fantastic online resources available to assist in broaching the topic of outdoor safety with children. Clever Never Goes is a web website offering an alternative to the former Stranger Danger message. Their resources aim to help you ensure your children are safe while enabling them to learn for themselves too. There are plenty of child-friendly activities on the website and you can visit that at clevernevergoes.org slash parents dash two. Our detectives have been very busy dealing with a number of serious offences including arsons in Sandown and drug-related violence in Ride area. Following an incident in Oakfield on May the 3rd, Two men were charged with drugs and weapons offences and are currently being prosecuted. At the beginning of May, the road policing officers were joined by the mainland road safety team to tackle dangerous driving. The objective was in part to educate motorists about driving practices and to promote what we call the fatal four. The four poor driving habits most likely to lead to a fatal accident. These are speeding, using your phone behind the wheel, not wearing a seat belt and driving while under the influence of drink or drugs. I urge anyone using our roads this summer to please do so responsibly and think about the consequences that poor driving can have. Our partners who make up the island's Domestic Abuse Forum and Serious Sexual Offences Reduction Group have been working on a campaign with the local council, raising awareness of sexual violence and how to seek support if you've been affected. We encourage anyone who's been a victim to report it to us on 101. There are other organisations out there that can help you, including the Hampton Trust, who offer specialist support to islanders affected by sexual abuse. You can call them on 0800-234-6266 or visit their website hamptontrust.org.uk And this is my view from one of our col columnists, uh, Jonathan Young. Drift to one party state needs centre-left pact. I lost a bet with myself over the outcome of last month's local election. I was convinced that low turnout, high postal voting and the vaccine bounce would see the Tories home and dry with room to spare. They tell you, tell you never to chase your losses, but I chased mine and lost again. Following the cliffhanger results, I rated as vanishingly small the prospects of the 21 elected non-Tories uniting behind a leader candidate. They did it. 
bucking a national trend in a way which ought to give Steve Hastings, Dave Pugh and one or two bad losers at the Isle of Wight Council annual meeting pause for thought. But what a close shave it was, any closer and the if only inquest would now be underway. Specifically, if only there had been a little more pre-election strategic pragmatism among people and parties whose political outlook aligned more with one another than with those of the incumbents. Take, for example, the result in Bryston, Calbourne and Shalfleet. Conservative, 43.6%. Lib Den, 30%. Green, 26.6%. Had only one candidate stood against former Kipper councillor Hastings, an entirely plausible split in the absent candidate's vote would have put pay to his prospects, even allowing for some abstentions. But there was to be no repeat of the Green Lib Dem deal on the island in the 2019 general election. That avoidable ward result and others explain the faux outrage in Tory leafleting pre poll at the absence elsewhere of enough opposition candidates to split the vote. These lessons are important because, away from the island, the apparent slide into a one-party state continues unabated. The Martin Bashir affair, which hit a, a particularly sweet spot for the Tories, is an illustration an opportunity to prop up an increasingly scrutinised monarchy, while at the same time not satisfied with stuffing the BBC's top echelons with its placement, shredding its last vestiges of independence and financial viability on the back of poor behaviour by a young reporter 25 years ago. Reality check. Neither Bashir nor anyone else at the BBC was the third person in the royal marriage, None of them unveiled a naive 19-year-old into an arranged marriage masquerading as a love match and then wondered why she struggled so badly and nor did any of them get Dodie Isle Fayed's chauffeur drunk. Then there is the attack on judicial review used in 2019 to assert Parliament's right to scrutinise the government rather than be stood down on the Prime Minister's whim. That won't be allowed to happen again if Downing Street's current intentions are put into law. Also on the agenda are two strands of Trumpian ballot meddling, the planned return to first past the post for mayora contests, benefiting as it does the unsplintered right and the ID requirement at polling station, which solves no real world problem, less having too many people voting who don't possess a passport or driving licence, is regarded as a problem. As we emerge gingerly from the health emergency, Britain's democratic emergency needs to once again take centre stage. Extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures, as Covid has taught us, and a little more electoral pragmatism by the centre and left, starting at the top, would be a useful beginning. And now for some, um, some more news items. Late night music plan for cows. A cow's pub is asking to extend the hours music can play at night, but one local resident says the music is so loud they cannot sleep. The Vector's Tavern on Cow's High Street is applying to play music until 1.30am most nights. The application will be heard by the Isle of Wight Council's licensing subcommittee on Monday. Currently, the establishment is permitted to play music or have live performances until midnight from Monday to Saturday, 11pm on Sundays and 1am on Christmas Eve and Boxing Day. The pub, however, is allowed to stay open until 2.30am on Monday to Saturdays and 12.30am on Sundays. Now, music could be played until 1.30am Monday to Saturday and 2am on Christmas Eve, Boxing Day and New Year's Eve. In their application, the Vectors Tavern say they have always taken a hardline approach to ensure they are compliant with their licence. The Council's Environmental Health Officer said they were not opposed but had reservations about its impact on the neighbourhoods. A noise management plan submitted by the pub, however, allayed fears. Man held after citizen's arrest. A Newport man was arrested after a member of the public helped restrain him last Friday afternoon, police have confirmed. Officers were called at 2.32pm following a report of a robbery in South Street, Newport. A 36-year-old man from the Freshwater area was approached by two men who stole a quantity of cash from his wallet. 
officers located a man matching the description provided by the victim in Morrison's car park. Police praised a member of the public shopping with his children at the time for providing assistance at the scene. 39-year-old man from Newport was arrested on suspicion of robbery and threat to damage or destroy property. He was remanded in custody. A 38-year-old man from Sandown was also arrested on suspicion of robbery but later released under investigation. Sentenced for neglect. A mother who admitted neglecting her baby has been sentenced at the Isle of Wight Magistrates Court. The woman, who cannot be named to protect the identity of her two children, admitted neglecting a child to cause unnecessary suffering or injury on November the 11th. The 23-year-old baby was just a few weeks old when a social worker reported the neglect. Liz Miller, prosecuting at the first hearing, said the mother had not cared for the baby in a suitable manner. The baby was soaked in urine, cold and crying with hunger. In 2020, the woman was cautioned for the same offence with her other child. Keith Verinder, for the woman, said both children had been taken away from her and placed with their maternal grandparents. She suffers mental health problems, he said. She was given an 18-month community order, fined £40 and must pay a victim surcharge of £95 and court costs of £85. And for cricket fans, we have a cricket feast at Newclose. A second match between Hampshire and Middlesex will kick off a two-week feast of cricket at the Newclose Cricket Festival at Newclose County Cricket Ground today, Friday. The match, part of this year's ECB First Class Counties T20 tournament, starts at 2pm, the first of a two-week list of fixtures during the festival. With government rules on spectator sports easing, the game is not being played behind closed doors, with free parking and admission to the ground. Spectators are welcome to bring their own picnics with drinks and snacks also available from the pavilion. Young musicians selected to support Beverly Craven. The Isle of Wight Youth Jazz Orchestra has been invited to support vocalist Beverly Craven in a concert at Hambledon Vineyard on June the 26th. The Brit Award winning singer-songwriter is headlining an open-air music and fizz concert at the venue near Waterlooville in Hampshire. The event is being held in memory of much-loved local wife and mother Tara Smith, who was a close friend of the orchestra and who died of breast cancer at the age of 49. Proceeds will go to Wessex Cancer Trust and Rowan's Hospice. Beverly Craven has spoken publicly about her own breast cancer diagnosis, first in 2005 and again in 2018. Jackie Tarry from the Isle of Wight Youth Jazz Orchestra said, We were thrilled to be asked to take part in this prestigious concert, which has been delayed due to COVID-19. Hambleton Vineyard is a beautiful venue, and as it will hopefully be the first weekend after the first the final easing of lockdown, it should be a really special event. Cam Rossi, 18, who will be leading the band on the day, added, Rehearsals have been difficult, mainly we've only been able to get together online, but we are now able to rehearse together, which is great. An island woman is warning us to be careful where we stand on the beach after a discarded fishing hook appears to her dog's paw. Sandy was playing on Yavelin Beach recently when she let out a big scream, owner Tina Scott Roberts told the county press. Tina said, I rushed over to discover that a fishing hook, complete with bait and line, had gone into her foot. It had gone straight through and out the other side. The line still had the bait attached. Sandy, who is seven and works as a therapy dog, had to be carried off the beach and was taken to an emergency vet appointment. The hook was removed, the wound washed out and Sandy was given a course of antibiotics. Tina has pleaded with people who are fishing on beaches to ensure everything is taken home, calling it a truly awful experience and one that she does not want to be repeated. Braiding Town Football Club begin a landmark year with major cup win. 150th festivities kick off in style. 
Braiding Town, one of the world's oldest football clubs, have got their 150th anniversary celebration off to the best possible start. Their emphatic Hampshire Immediate Cup Intermediate Cup victory over Shanklin in Saturday's long overdue final in front of a bumper crowd of more than 350 at East Cows Vic's Beatrice Avenue Stadium could not have been timed any better. Proud Braiding Chairman Jeff Ruck said, What a wonderful way to kick off our club's 150th anniversary. It was a final full of high quality football and I'm absolutely delighted by the professional way we went about things. We were magnificent from the first ball to the last. Braiding had an opportunity to make it an even better day had the reserves not fallen short against Southampton-based Testlands in the Hampshire Plate final. But it was still a great achievement for them to get there nevertheless. Earlier in the year, there was an overwhelming feeling that the coronavirus pandemic may just scupper everything for the club, nicknamed the Romans in their special anniversary year, like it has almost every other aspect of life. Football could not have been further from people's thoughts as the death toll rose. But when lockdown eventually turned the numbers game around, Restrictions on outdoor sports were relaxed and the club's two finals, which should have been played in April last year, were given the go-ahead. That is when the feel-good factor began to return. Winning the Intermediate Cup for the fourth time, Braiding's last win prior to Saturday's being 45 years ago, could not have signalled a better start to the 150th year celebrations. We intended to have events throughout the year to mark the 150th, but that wasn't possible because of coronavirus, Jeff added. What we now plan to do is host a long weekend of events in August to celebrate this landmark. Braiding were formed in 1871, before they joined the Island League on its formation in 1898. After gaining promotion to Division 1 in 1948, Braiding enjoyed one of the most successful eras in the club's history. During the 1950s, the club won the Division I Championship for a record eight consecutive years. A record West White came close to equalling with their seven in a row, together with the six currently achieved by Whitecroft and Barton Sports. Braiding celebration weekend at their superb Vicarage Lane ground will feature a match played under 1871 rules together with a prestige match and games for women, girls and youths. There will also be live music and a players reunion although details on the event have yet to be unveiled. An island woman who has devoted three decades to studying and preserving red squirrels hopes to complete work on an all-encompassing publication on the beloved animals by the end of 2021. Writing up 30 years of red squirrel work on the island was the task Helen Butler set herself during lockdown. She she is inviting others to send their red squirrel photos in so they can be considered for inclusion in the final piece. The first part of the story is now ready to download from the White Squirrel Project website. The second part will cover data and past research, including sightings sent in by the general public plus biannual woodland monitoring carried out by dedicated volunteers. The concluding third instalment will focus on the challenging subject of mortality and morbidity. Helen said, there is so much information it was a nightmare trying to work out how to present it. In the end it had to be split into three parts, then into sections and chapters. The finished publication will be useful as a reference for anyone taking on red squirrel work on the island. Helen aims to finish the extensive project by the end of the year, although she admits work has slowed recently due to some technical issues and the lifting of lockdown. Are you a young island creative? The 2021 Mike Howley Trust Awards are open for applications. Mike Howley, who worked for many years as Director of Cultural Services for the Isle of Wight Council, died in May 2013, 
leaving part of his estate for the specific benefit of aspiring young actors, musicians, dancers and writers between 18 and 30 who are living on the island. Creatives can apply for funding of up to £5,000 to help them realise their artistic ambitions. The fund is for investment in areas such as training, equipment, staging, publishing costs or simply time to create. Due to the terms, funding is not available for visual artists. The Trust is asking for written applications this year although people can request to apply in an alternative format. To apply, discuss your idea or ask for support with the application process. Contact the team by email at mht at keyarts.org. The deadline is midnight on Tuesday, June the 15th. Newport runner Gary Marshall, 40, won Sunday's gruelling Needles Half Marathon with a time of 1 hour 90 minutes and 11 seconds. Gary only started racing three years ago, winning the Isle of Wight Marathon, Marathon at his first attempt in 2018. He was pipped to the post in the Needles Half in 2019, but won by four minutes on Sunday, crossing the line with his daughters Rosie and Megan. Gary said it was great to be back racing at a super event on a glorious day with perfect conditions. I ran through the finish line with my two biggest fans, certainly a memory I'll cherish forever. Gary runs with Ride Harriers and Wooten Bridge Runners and wore the red vest of the Ride Club on Sunday. Second man was Francesco Meloni and third Joe Driscoll. First woman was Valerie Sesto, 49 of Lymington, who had won the Needles Half about 10 years ago. Second woman was Helen Scales and third Poppy Tanner. The Needles Half is the highlight of the Isle of Wight Festival of Running organised by the West White Sports and Community Centre Freshwater. The 2020 event was cancelled and this year's five races attracted 700 runners, the most in the festival's history. Claire Giffin, WWSCC manager, said the festival's huge success was down to the fantastic runners of all ages and the wonderful volunteers who marshalled and ran registration. Running a Covid safe event for 700 people over two days demanded a massive amount of planning plus cooperation from everyone. We're also very grateful for sponsorship from Love Running, Benbridge Harbour, PO41 Yarmouth Coffee House and White Fibre. Two Island MPs boundary split revealed. The latest proposals to split the Isle of Wight into two constituencies have been revealed. The Boundary Commission for England has published its initial pro proposals to redraw cons constituencies across the country to ensure they are more equally balanced in terms of voter numbers. Some island constituencies, such as the Isle of Wight and the Isle of Anglesey, have been granted special dispensation to be outside the population remit. However, the Isle of Wight, which currently has the biggest electorate, will go from one constituency to two, east and west. While the west is a much larger area geographically, the east area encompasses Shanklin, Sandown, Brading, Ryde, Wootton, East Cowes and part of Newport. The Commission is required to draw up seats with 69,724 to 77,062 electors, a condition which it said meant widespread change was in inevitable. The Commission stressed that the proposals, which opened for an initial eight-week public consultation period were provisional. It is not due to make its final recommendations to Parliament until July 2023. Current Isle of Wight MP Bob Seeley said today, some islanders have said they want one MP and it makes for simplicity and clarity. That's a sound argument. However, this does mean we will get two MPs and therefore provide the other MP like me make sure he or she is focused on delivering for the island. It will mean we have a second vote in Parliament. The important thing is both MPs work together. Richard Quigley, Isle of Wight Labour Chair, said, 
Many islanders will hope that it doesn't just lead to more of the same broken promises over the island deal and the lack of help for the island. TV naturalists Chris Packham and partner Charlotte Corney have given a huge boost to a fundraising competition being run by the island's RSPCA branch. Springwatch presenter Chris and Charlotte, who founded the Wild Heart Trust charity, which runs the Wild Heart Animal Sanctuary at Yaviland, have entered the RSPCA's home pet show by submitting a picture with their miniature poodles, Sid and Nancy. The couple have urged other animal lovers to enter the competition, which is raising money to support animal welfare, welfare activity at the centre at God's Hill. The Home Pet Show is an event designed to showcase animals and the special bonds they share with their human companions. Islanders are invited to submit photographs or video footage with local winners being put forward to regional finals of the national competition. Chris said, We are delighted to enter Sid and Nancy, who are siblings aged just over two years. The work of the RSPCA is so important. Entries cost £2.50 each, with funds going to the RSPCA Isle of Wight. Winners will be invited for refreshments and a VIP behind-the-scenes tour of the RSPCA IW Animal Rescue Centre. And that's all we have time for today. So it's goodbye from Madeline. And goodbye from Pauline. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Good evening. Tonight, after a large response from you on our item about e-scooters, we speak to Europe's biggest operator as trials begin in London this week. The issue of parking is a really critical one. And I think what the UK trials have shown is it's not just the vehicle that's being put on trial, but also the operators as well. So if they're here to stay, just how can e-scooters be made compatible with the lives of people who are blind or partially sighted? But first, the importance of lighting in the home is something that we've touched on before on the programme, but not recently. So slap on the wrist to us because it is something which, if done right, can be life changing for people with some useful sight. Two things have prompted us to return to it now. One from a listener. We'll come to that in a moment. But first, also the uh, go to guide for lighting in the home of people who are blind or partially sighted was published by the Thomas Pocklington Trust in 2018 and now it's been updated and uh, we can get a sneak preview of the latest version before it's been published with the man who authored it, Peter Hodgson, who joins me now. It's not too big a claim, is it, Peter, really, that the right lighting can make a huge difference? I think it's right, yes, um, Peter. The advantage of having really good high level of lighting spread throughout the property really can make life safer and gives them the ability to live independently better than they would have if they had poor levels of lighting, which is something that the, uh, the Thomas Pockington research they did some years ago proved. So why the new report? What's changed in the world of lighting over the past three years? Lighting technology, especially LED, light emitting diode technology, is developing dramatically quickly, as with all technology. And we just felt it just needed a, a quick review, a quick update in some areas, taking out a few of the lights which have disappeared due to energy saving requirements over the last couple of years since we last did the report. Now let's bring in our listener. She's Lynn Bailey from Glasgow. And Lynn got in touch about finding the right lighting solutions for a mum who is uh, 83 and has poor sight. So we thought we'd bring you two together. Lynn, I gather your mum preferred you to do the talking on this one. Yes, yes, that's right, yep. Uh, so tell us a bit about her, first of all. What kind of place does she live in and, and what's her level of vision? My mother has a macular degeneration, which she's had for a number of years. But in the last year or so, there was a sudden deterioration in her sight. So she is now severely sight impaired and in addition has Charles Bonney syndrome. So her low vision means it's very important, obviously, to get suitable lighting for her around the home to replace what she currently has. Mm. And I, and I guess a, we better re- just tell people who don't know that uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome is something where you actually sometimes see things that are not there and people worry yeah. about that. But it, it's purely, it is a visual phenomenon, mm, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, Lynn, meet Peter. What would you like to ask him? Well, I was just going to say that she lives in a, a one bedroom flat, which is within a retirement complex. So the lighting is the original lighting of about 20 years ago. So it mainly comprises of the more traditional central ceiling lights, which are not 
what now suitable for our current needs. And looking around, I did look at other retirement properties and those I saw were using recessed downlighters. And so that was something I was considering using because I know that that would provide some uniform lighting around the home to avoid the light and dark patches. I was really keen to find out if that's something that you would recommend. Peter? In terms of, yes, old fashions of lighting is generally a pendant light in the middle of the room. You don't necessarily need to replace that. One of the recommendations we've come up with is actually adding additional lighting in a room. So you could put standard lights or up lighters in corners of rooms, shining up onto the ceiling and using the ceiling as a reflector. So you're spreading a good level of light evenly throughout the whole room. I don't know if your mum's flat's got wall lights. I'm assuming not. But if, if you have got wall lights, you can improve those again lights that sort of uh, shine up onto the ceiling, use that as a reflector, will will give a greatly improved level of lighting. Mm -hmm. Make sure you don't get glare, so some sort of diffusers on the light, so you're not actually seeing the light source directly. You don't want to be looking directly at a bright source of light. Yeah. Uh, paper shades, the old-fashioned sort of Chinese lanterns are very good at that if you have a central pendant light. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, if you can provide dimmer switches to the lighting, also helps. It means you can provide probably more level of lighting than you need. Your mum then has the ability to turn the lighting to a level that she's happy with that works for her. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lynn, what are the things that your mum f does find difficult with the lighting that she's got at the moment? In the kitchen, for example, she struggles to see the kitchen sink. And so when she's washing up, then there's not good lighting there. And again, I was wondering whether the recessed lighting just directly above the kitchen sink would work well. Yeah, I think some form of lighting over the sink, a spotlight, a recessed light shining onto that area would be a really big help. Mm -hmm. In terms of sort of kitchen lighting generally, very old fashioned sound, but linear fluorescent strip lights down the centre of the room. I think your mum's kitchen is a, a galley kitchen, so it's probably long and thinner. A linear light down the middle of the ceiling is probably going to give a very good level of background lighting without causing too many shadows. Mm -hmm. And you can then sure. add sort of LED strip lights, little fluorescent lights, or even LED lights on a self adhesive tape now, which you can just connect with a transformer into existing sockets so you don't need to do wiring, but you can put those on the bottom of the wall cupboards directly over the worktop, put them at the front so they're not in sight, but that will give a, a really good level of lighting on worktops as well. If your mum's trying to do things like chopping food and preparing food, it really does help with that. But would you actually recommend or, or not having the downlighters in a room, let's say in the lounge? Or The problem with recessed downlighters is, is that they can be very glary. You end up with a light source that's very close to the ceiling. So if it's, a, if it's not particularly high ceiling, you may end up with glare from that. Mm -hmm. The second thing is if you don't get the right sort of light within the recessed fitting, it can give a very narrow beam of light. So you end up with a patch of light on the floor and you end up with lots of patches of light on the floor, dark areas between. So you need to make sure if you are going to for that sort of lighting that you have wide beam lights within them so they give a good spread of light. Mm -hmm. I think another thing to think about if you are going to retrofit these type of lights, fire protection, you can't just start cutting holes necessarily in the yeah. ceiling because it, <laughs> it may breach the fire protection. So you've got to make sure that it's either a fire resistant fitting or you have some sort of fire barrier behind it. Sure. And, and would you have any kind of way of determining how many lights would be suitable in a room? Is there any kind of formula that helps to determine what would work to avoid the dark patches? The simple answer is there is no simple formula to do it, I'm afraid. It basically, the bigger the room, the more lighting you're going to need, both in terms of floor area and ceiling height. Both will impact on it. I think if you get a good electrician, they should be able to calculate how many lights you'll need to give a certain lighting level within a, a room of a certain size using a certain type of light. So they should be able to calculate that for you and come up with the number of lights and the spread positioning of those lights to make it work. It often helps to visualise this, talk about this in terms of particular tasks. And Lynn, I, I mean, mm. what about choosing clothes? Does your mum find that a bit different? Difficult, the whole matching up business. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, without doubt, trying to see what is in a wardrobe is, is difficult for her. And so, you know, her preference tends to be to have clothes sitting on the outside so that she can see it from the natural light that comes into the room. So I was certainly keen to see if there were a good solution to provide strong lighting in the wardrobe. And it's something that's often overlooked. There are some reasonably simple solutions to it. You could install, as you do under the kitchen wall cupboards, some sort of fluorescent, little fluorescent lights or LED strip lights within the wardrobe, perhaps on the shelf above the hanging rail. Again, just make sure they're not in your mum's line of sight directly so she's not getting glare mm -hmm. from them. And if you can't get hard wiring to those, you can't find some way of plugging those in. There are now many battery operated LED lights. You can just stick in self-adhesive or a couple of screws will fix those in. And often those come with sensors, so they will turn on when your mum opens the wardrobe door and then turn off after a period of time. 
Is Lynn going to have to spend a fortune to get this kind of what, what you've been talking about? Probably not. A lot of it is just adding, changing bulbs, lamps. If you're not going to go to the extent of having to rewire to cloud wall lights and things, buying a, a couple of up lighters for a, a room, not be a huge amount of money. So really, no, it shouldn't be a particularly expensive thing to do. How much do your lighting needs and solutions vary with the type of site condition that you've got? The research showed that for most eye conditions, better lighting is a big advantage. There will be some conditions which won't benefit. Some people do need less light. They, you know, they have a, a condition which will require them to have lower levels of lighting. But generally, the high level of lighting is, is something that the research showed that most people with um, partial sight found beneficial. Peter Hodgson, Lynn Bailey, thank you both very much indeed. And if you have any suggestions for good lighting or tips on how it's worked for you, do get in touch. You can email us at intouch at bbc.co.uk. And now to some of your emails. Last week, we talked about the role of genetics for people who are blind or visually impaired. Darren Wicks emailed to say... I was interested in your most recent programme about genetic testing and perhaps why retinitis pigmentosa sufferers should or shouldn't be enthusiastic about getting tested. The week before your programme, I received my results from Addenbrooke's in Cambridge. I have a 20-year-old son and I've always been concerned about the possible impact on him and if he would have to take steps if he planned to have a family of his own. My results have provided reassurance and certainty for my family because the mutation identified is not passed from father to son. There's a bonus too. As a result of the RP mutation being identified, I was able to research it. I'm not getting ahead of myself and expecting any sort of readily available treatment soon, but I can stay aware of the outcome of the clinical trials and any implications that they may have for me and others. I know some people have no interest in finding out, but for my family, it's been a bit of a game changer. On the same subject, Brian Gaff wrote... There was no discussion about the role of counsellors. The problem when I was 16 in 1966 was that it was the clinicians who gave the advice to not father children, as if it was really bad for society, or it's somehow your duty to not pass on the gene. I do hope that this has changed. I never did have children, and I've missed the boat at 70. But for others, this really might be very much a current problem. Remember, at the age I was, you absolutely take notice of those who are older and supposedly wiser. Well, as you can hear in Brian's email, it is such an emotive subject. But my impression and my hope would be that the purpose of genetic counselling would be to give people the information they need, but leave the decision about having children to them. Well, do keep your thoughts coming in on that. And you did really want to talk about e-scooters after our item a couple of weeks ago. There was a lot of criticism, but Jane Swain is a fan. I like e-scooters. I think they're good for the environment. I'm partially sighted. I can see with only one eye and not brilliantly with the other. Consequently, I can't drive. Anything that makes it easier for me to get around is positive. So I welcome e-scooters. I already ride an electric bike. I also ride on the pavement when the road is busy. It's safer for me, but I do always slow down and give way to pedestrians. Well, of course, riding on the pavement is always going to be controversial. It's not allowed, for one thing, Jane. And on the environmental benefits, Tim Millia was angered that we didn't talk more about that aspect. The focus on someone leaving an e-scooter on the pavement being a hazard was ludicrous. As a society, we're going to have to get used to near-silent electric vehicles. Very little on Radio 4 completely incenses me. This piece did. Well, Tim, perhaps you don't have to pick your way through the increasing amount of obstacles on our pavements with poor or no sight, as Rhiannon Valladini spelt out in our recent programme on this subject. I had one particular incident where I was walking with a friend who had to bodily move me out of the way because I was going to fall over it as I couldn't identify where it had been left. Uh, and it was just laying across the pavement in the dark. I've also walked into their handlebars when they've just been propped up against cafe seating areas in the middle of pavements. And a lot of the walkways in Cambridge are very narrow already without further obstacles sort of being lent against chairs or just 
just lent up against windows uh, where the the foot bars are just left in the path. Which is exactly why we did want to return to the topic of e-scooters, not just because we had a big response to it, but because the largest trial yet in any single area of the country has started in London this week. It's thought the results of this trial along with the others in 50 towns and cities in the UK, will be pivotal in whether the government decide to make e-scooters a permanent feature of the landscape and, crucially, whether owning one privately could be made legal, which it currently isn't. Well, there are three companies involved in the trials in London. One of them is TIA. Their regional manager, Fred Jones, joined me from the launch in Canary Wharf. And since we were upbraided by Tim about the environmental benefits, I began by asking Fred about that first. Well, I think, you know, it's not too controversial to say that cars have a pretty negative impact on our cities and towns. Around 60% of car trips are under five kilometres and involve just one person in the car. And this is like the perfect sweet spot for uh, people replacing those with an e-scooter, which is obviously zero emission. And so they offer a really sustainable and environmentally friendly way of getting around and hopefully solving this chronic problem of congestion and pollution in our cities. But as you heard there, one of the biggest problems for people who are blind or partially sighted is that these are often left parked on the streets for people to bump into. How are you dealing with those concerns? You're obviously aware of them. Absolutely. I mean, the first thing to say is these are valid concerns and they do pose a risk because of their silence. We've set up our UK safety board representing the sight loss community. So we've got the Thomas Poplington Trust and London Vision and Transport for All on there. And they scrutinise our approach and advise us to develop the safest possible service in the UK. And of course, one of the points that's often made is having some sort of audio alarm or have the scooters make a distinctive noise would be very helpful to people who are blind as obviously they're electric, so they're like silent assassins. What work are you doing on this? So we were the first operator to commit to developing this solution and fitting it onto our scooters in the UK. Now, when we started this bit of work and, and made this commitment, we you know, asked, well, you know, what's the right sound and how should it work? And because no one's done this before, there was no standard to follow. So over the past six months, we've been working really closely with the Thomas Pocklington Trust and Sight Loss Councils to conduct some research to define this solution. And I'm really pleased with the progress we've made. We're just a few weeks and months away from completing that work and we're hoping to roll out this solution in the back end of this year. You say, you know, there hasn't been much work on this, but there's been work on e-cars, haven't they? Which is exactly the, the same kind of problem. In they're, they're very quiet. Couldn't you just borrow that work? Haven't they got come to some reasonable conclusions yet? Not yet. You're right. Both electric buses and electric cars suffer the same challenge. So there are companies looking at that work. There's no industry standard for micromobility for bikes and, and scooters. And of course, the other thing is that... Um, e-scooters dumped on the pavement by people they're not going to be making any noise anyway are they the issue of parking is a really critical one and i think what the uk trials have shown is it's not just the vehicle that's being put on trial but also the operators as well and there's a number of operators in the uk at the moment at tier we strongly advocate uh, for mandatory parking it's not possible with a, a tier scooter in york or london to just leave it parked anywhere blocking the pavements leaning up against cafes, as some of your listeners explained in their emails. With a tier scooter, you can only end the trip if it's parked in a very specific location, often like a car parking space that's been repurposed. And we've invested heavily in the technology to make sure that that's done accurately. We've had you know, over 98% parking compliance in York. We haven't had any complaints or issues from the local visually impaired community. And I'm really proud of the steps we've taken to show how e-scooters can be operated safely. Do you think e-scooters should be made legal for private ownership? One of the challenges with private scooters versus shared scooters is the lack of control and standards. So to give you an example of what that might be, you know, we have our scooters, large wheels and suspension that makes it suitable for riding on the road. Our scooters at Tier have indicator lights and crash helmets included uh, in our service up in York. All these are really important to make people feel safe on our scooters and therefore ride them correctly on the road. Whereas if you're on a flimsy private scooter, you might be more tempted to go on the pavements. And I think that's a dangerous thing. Fred Jones from Tier. 
Well, we'll listen out for his scooters and when uh, we do get those audio warnings fitted. And that's it for this week. Do continue to send us your views on anything you hear in the programme or indeed don't hear and think you ought to. You can email in touch at bbc.co.uk. You can leave a message on 0161 836 1338 or go to our website bbc.co.uk forward slash in touch from where you can get more information or download tonight's and many past editions of the programme. From me, Peter White, producer Simon Hoven and studio managers Sharon Hughes and Phil Booth. Goodbye. In the Fentner area, Fentner Heritage Museum in Spring Hill, 4 Church Street, 28A Pier Street, Lucknow House, Wallace Road, Roxall, and skips outside South Bank Park Avenue. In the ride area, at 4, 4 South Street, 13 Esplanade Street, 51 George Street, Ward Associates, 39 Union Street, 30 Nelson Street, Jack's, 75 Union Street, The Anchorage, Seafield Road, Sea View. And in the Newport area, 11 Orchard Street, the Old Mill, St Cross Lane, Guildhall High Street, H Samuels, 35 High Street, Watson Bull and Porter, 31 High Street, 118 to 119, the Old Grammar School in St James's Street, Halifax High Street, and there are skips at 45 Caesars Road. In the Cowles area, 31 Mill Hill Road, 72 High Street, Toby's of Cowles, 9 High Street, and 5 Birmingham Road. In the Yarmouth area, at Southford, 1 Tennyson Road, Grove Cottage, St James's Street, skips on the, at On The Rocks Bridge Road. And in the Freshwater area, Royal Standard, 15 School Green Road, and skips at One Court Road.